uh, to everyone to the online book launch of uh, Recharting the History of Economic Thought, uh, which is a textbook on the history of economic thought that has been co-edited by Kevin Dean uh, and myself. My name is um, Elisa Rameinberg. I am the co-head of the economics department at SOAS um, University of London, a job that I share with my colleague and fellow contributor to the book, uh, Hannah Bargal who is here with us and who will speak later. So we are here to celebrate the tremendous achievement uh, that is this uh, edited textbook. And this is a tremendous achievement uh, for two main reasons. First, the book has been uh, very long in the making and it's truly wonderful uh, to see it finally in its physical form. Here it is. And secondly, uh, the book is the first in what will hopefully be a series of collective outputs that to emerge from the Reteaching Economics Network. Uh, Reteaching Economics was set up quite some years ago as a network of economic lecturers who sought to respond uh, collectively to the economic students' dissatisfaction with the state of their discipline and the teaching that they were accessing at universities. So reteaching economics so to formulate a response to the students' demands by creating um, a forum of exchange amongst like-minded economics teachers who are dissatisfied with uh, mainstream economics. And uh, the main aim is or what is, was is to use the forum as a way uh, to devise strategies to strengthen heterodox traditions within economics teaching uh, in universities. So the book, Recharting the History of Economic Thought, is then um, an important pedagogical resource to come out of that encounter. And it seeks to support economics teachers across English speaking universities in their um, attempt to break the grips of mainstream economics over uh, university curricula. The way it does that will be illustrated in detail by some of the contributors to the book uh, during this uh, webinar, during the launch. And, and with that, let me pass the, the floor to my colleague and co-editor, Kevin Dean, who will say a few words about the way in which the book project took shape. And this will then be followed by brief interventions by some of the contributors to the book, in which they will demonstrate how their chapters use the history of economic thought to highlight the limits of neoclassical economics in a particular core uh, economic uh, topic. Now, this will be followed by a Q&A, so please pop your questions in the chat box that you see on the right-hand side of uh, your screen as we go along, and we will get back to them uh, after uh, the various uh, presentations. Also, uh, please note that uh, this event is uh, recorded. So with that, I, I hand over uh, to Kevin, uh, who will say a few more things about how this book actually came about. Over to you, Kevin. Cool. That's great. Thanks, Elisa. And welcome, everybody, to our launch. Thanks for joining us. Um, so yeah, just to give you some background, um, I mean, the idea for this book came about um, during my first year of, uh, of teaching post-PhD. So imagine I'd left the comfort, uh, of, uh, the heterodox comfort of SOAS after, at the end of my PhD. And I started a new role at the University of Northampton. Um, and this was about August 2013, I think. And on joining, I was asked to teach uh, a brand new module on the history of economic thought. Uh, now, this this is a subject that I'd never really formally studied myself. So, you know, naturally, having been given that module to teach, I did what most academics would do. I looked at a range of different curriculum and textbooks on the history of economic thought, and I put together a fairly standard chronological curriculum for the students, basically starting with Adam Smith and going through a range of different economists from the history of economic thought in a fairly chronological order. Now, by about week six or seven, it was really clear that this was not interesting to my students. Um, and, and so I actually had quite an honest discussion with them in the classroom. I basically sat them down and said, look, this isn't working. You're not finding this interesting. Um, and I promised to think about how, how I could deliver this in a different way. And that's really where Elisa comes in. So. Um, Following a number of conversations with Elisa around how I might change the way I taught this this particular subject, 
uh, we decided to, well, at least suggested to me that why don't I teach in, in a thematic way and use this history of economic thought module as a vehicle for introducing some genuine pluralist economics into what, apart from some international development modules, was a very standard mainstream economics curricula. And so that's basically exactly what I did. So I said to the students over the Christmas break at, 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 after semester one that I would go away, redesign the module, and I came back and we had a conversation in at the beginning of the, the second semester around the fact there are different economic approaches, different schools of thought, that they were being taught one um, specific version of economics that was being presented to them as the only version of economics uh, and that I introduced this teaching approach. So the idea between behind teaching the history of economic thought in a thematic way is to move this from a kind of chronological view about how ideas develop over time to thinking about how can we use and, and draw upon different ideas across the history of economic thought and apply them to, 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 to today. So the way, I, the way that we did this, I brainstormed with the students a range of economic questions that they, they wanted answers to. Things like, for example, what causes economic crisis and how do we get out of them, which has ended up being one of the chapters in the book. Because, you know, up to that point, and this was halfway through their undergraduate degree, um, our students had not had any discussion about the financial crisis in the rest of their um, standard economics, macro, micro and econometrics modules. So together we brainstormed a range of different questions, we edited them, and then for the second semester, uh, every week was based around a discussion of a particular question um, to do with economics. And we approached that question in, in by doing three different things. So we looked at how neoclassical or mainstream economics would approach the answer to that question. We looked at some critical comments, and then we looked at what a range of other economists from the history of economics would, would have to say about that question as well. <clears throat> so th this was what I began, to, the way I began to teach this at um, Northampton. And I, I did this for, for five years. Um, this was supported by my colleague, Shkorki Arif, who, who joined, the, joined the unit. And you know, a, a few years into that, we, we pitched this idea to, to the publishers as a, um, to, to turn this into a, into a textbook and, and it all went on from there. Um, so that's really where the idea came from. Um, we then got uh, a lot of our colleagues involved in, in writing different chapters and I can actually um, put a list of the chapters up um, for you all to see. So, so this, this is, the book's basically 15 substantive chapters with an introduction. And as you can see, um, each chapter is a, a question about economics and um, kind of divided roughly into two sections. So we have, a, have a, a range of questions that kind of get at some of the core economic concepts and issues um, and very much speak to, to the concerns raised by neoclassical economics, such as thinking about rationality, consumption, production, equilibrium in, uh, income distribution and money, and, and importantly, value as well. Then we have, I guess, a second, uh, more applied um, set of questions that reflects not only the interest of myself and our authors, but also the interests of the students that, that I initially um, created this, this approach with. So that the book was commissioned probably about four years ago, maybe three and a half years ago. So it has been um, quite a while in, in the making, um, but we, we believe that this was this was worth it, uh, and we hope that um, people who then who, who do read the book uh, will, will agree. As Elise was saying, this book is aimed at, I guess, two different audiences. We're, we're hoping that students who are interested in pluralist economics will um, find this book interesting, and we also hope that academics who are teaching economics and want to introduce pluralism into their curricula um, will also find this book useful, either to build a History of, history of economic thought module around this approach, or by using this book as a complement to, um, you know, other other modules, macro, micro, micro, or development, for example, um, especially in in settings where, um, you know, colleagues were are, are expected to teach predominantly the mainstream approach. So that's really the background of the book and who who we 
hope will find this interesting. Um, I do have some some thanks. Um, this is from a, a, both Elisa and myself. We're very grateful to all our colleagues who contributed to uh, to this book. Um, everybody was really enthusiastic from the beginning and all the authors really embraced the idea behind the book, the approach that we we're trying to take. And they delivered far better chapters than I personally would have been able to do. Um, I'm not speaking for Elisa. Um, I'm definitely speaking for myself in that respect. So we really thank you for that. And whilst I thought the book was a good idea, it's definitely turned out even better than I, than I thought it would. We're grateful for Kingston University hosting and funding a, a workshop in, in the early stages to help us as a team talk through some ideas and how we might approach the book. And again, we're also very grateful for the support of our publishers, uh, Red Glow Press, Kirsty Reed, who's no longer there, um, was the, the editor that commissioned the book. And the publishers have been very supportive from, you know, our, our first contact. Um, and they, they understood enough about what we were trying to do to overlook um, some of the rather polemical reviews that we had from mainstream economists in the early stages. So we're very grateful and, and um, you know, we've had a lot of support of getting this over, over the line. We're also very grateful to Christina Lascaridis and Louise Villeneuve, who um, provided some research assistance, worked right at the end to really help us finalise things like the index and the list of economists at the front of the book. So we're very grateful for that. And finally, you know, I'm certainly grateful to all the students at the University of Northampton, Northampton that took my history, well, history economic thought module. Um, were subjected to this approach but also gave us good feedback um, and engaged with it and finally just to re-emphasize you know this is very much a team effort um, most of the contributors but not all of them um, are members of re our reteaching economics network and all, all royalties from the book will go to funding some expanded activities within the network Okay, so I think that's that's basically the background and overview of the book. Um, we have, well, we're very lucky to have eight of our authors here who, who will give a kind of short, brief overview of their chapter. Um, so if I'd like to invite uh, Joe to kick us off, uh, talking about uh, the chapter, how is income distributed? All right, do you hear me? Yes. How long do I have? Five minutes? Yes. OK, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, and I'm going to try and give you a very quick overview of my chapter in five minutes. So I apologize. I'm probably not going to be here for the Q&A because I have to go and look after my children, although I will try and rejoin. Um, but I may or may not be able to get involved. So my chapter is called How is Income Distributed? And it is an attempt to tell at least some of the story of the history of how this question has been tackled by economists over the last two or three hundred years. I should say at the outset that implicitly, and perhaps I should have been more explicit now I look back, this is about the question of how income is distributed within a particular society, so within a country or a particular area and I don't really engage with the question about global distribution development uh, and all of those absolutely crucial um, topics um, and so that, that probably should have been more explicit about that in the book so I start um, I mean, a key theme of the of the, the chapter is a distinction between surplus theories classical theories of distribution and neoclassical theories of distribution and I um, fairly predictably tell the story by starting with the classical uh, approach of Smith, of Ricardo, of Marx, going through uh, John Stuart Mill and then talking about uh, neoclassical approaches, the early marginalist uh, ideas of people like Jevons, um, and then talking about what I call the macroeconomics of distribution, um, and in particular ideas of people like Kaletsky, who developed an integrated analysis of uh, aggregate demand and distribution, so a simultaneous um, distribution and output system. And then I talk about the 
what I call the more recent, what I call it, the modern economics of distribution. And this is where I try and get from about 1950 up to the present day. Uh, and I, I think I'll probably throw my hands up and say, this is the part of the, the chapter that I'm probably least um, happy with. Um, and I would, I would sort of like to do again. I think it really needs a chapter or probably a book in its own right. And I'm not sure I'm fully qualified to write this, this history. But really, uh, th this section of the book goes from the solo model, the adoption of an aggregate production function through to um, really the, the current era. And I sort of bookend it with, with Piketty. So I sort of start with solo and end that um, section of the chapter with Piketty. So that's a very brief overview. I can see I probably used three or four minutes already. Let me just go back and, and pick up a few of the key points that I think might be worth um, emphasizing. So with Smith, we see you know, the beginning of the discussion and the idea that competition will equalize certain types of income. So Smith's one of Smith's key insights is the idea that competition between workers will equalize wage rates, competition between capitalists will equalize rates of profit. And from there, we get the question of, OK, competition will equalize types of income. But what determines the distribution between types of income, the three great um, income classes or, or social classes, profits, rents uh, and wages? And Smith uh, has the idea that wages are essentially um, subsistence determined. So then the, the problem is to determine the division between rents and profits. Smith doesn't come up with a convincing answer to that. Ricardo picks up the problem and by introduce, introducing the idea of marginalism, by introducing the idea of diminishing returns in agriculture, is able to produce a complete system in which all three um, types of income are determined. Marx, I don't have time to say a great deal about, but he solves in one way Smith's problem of how do we reconcile the fact that the worker is paid less than the output that the worker produces is sold for, i.e. where does profit come from? And Marx solves this problem by saying, well, it's to do with the unequal distribution of power between the capitalist and the worker. And I think really that is the basis for ongoing surplus theories of distribution of one kind or another. There's a big debate about how much Kolesky, um, you know, accepted or took on the labor theory of value, but I don't really find that discussion hugely important. I do think Kolesky and that, that macroeconomics of distribution is very much um, you know, a, a continuation of this Marxian uh, idea. Um, I give a brief overview of the marginalist idea, which I think is you know, fundamentally opposed to this Marxian surplus idea. And the, the punchline is, different types of income are determined by the relative contribution of factors of production to the production process. So the wage, the real wage is determined as the marginal productivity of labor, the additional contribution of the final so-called final unit of labor to production. And likewise, uh, the rate of interest is determined by the marginal productivity of capital. So that determines the supply, the demand <laughs> for each factor of production, not the supply. The supply is determined by an optimizing decision on the part of the worker between leisure and labor supply and on the part of the capitalist by how much are they willing to wait? How patient is the capitalist and therefore willing to wait for their return, i.e. Um, the rate of interest? Let me jump ahead and can I use one more minute? Have I got a minute left, Kevin? Yep. And say why I think this debate is still, uh, in my view, very relevant. Throughout the sort of what I call the modern era, there was an attempt to reconcile um, this marginalist approach with empirical reality, particularly in the 90s and 2000s, it became clear that inequality was rising within societies. In the US and the UK, for example, inequality rose sharply from the 1980s onwards. And to try and reconcile this with, uh, with the neoclassical marginal productivity theory, you have to come up with either a story about why different um, fact elements within factors of production, different units of labor are providing more or less to the productive process or something about why technology is changing. And we saw that culminate in what's called the skill bias technological change hypothesis, which argued that this, this rising inequality 
was due to technological change, which favored more skilled workers. Uh, and more skill was, of course, achieved by an optimizing trade off over one's human capital and so on. And I think this broke down towards the end of the 2000s when it became clear that the, the data didn't fit this new theory. And this gets us to where we are now, which is the world of post 2008 crisis uh, and now into the Corona crisis where we have secular stagnation, we have long term declines in real interest rates, which are very hard to uh, explain on the basis of these marginalist theories. And that's what people like Summers are trying to do with the secular stagnation hypothesis. And I think we're also seeing um, increasing acknowledgement that this kind of analysis, this kind of heterodox analysis, which draws on a surplus approach to distribution, does a better job. And, I, and I, I'll conclude by recommending um, a recent book by Pettis and Klein called Trade War Trade Wars Are Class Wars, something along those lines. And I haven't read it properly yet, but I've kind of skimmed uh, to get a sense of the, of the argument. And my sense is it takes a very um, heterodox Koletsky and surplus type approach to distribution um, and applies it to, to the, the current situation. OK, I will conclude. I'll just reiterate, I would like the the section on the, the modern economics um, of distribution to be to be better. And I do hope that somebody else who's more qualified would would write that book or write that paper so I can read it and then summarize it for a textbook. OK, I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much for, for listening. And I hand over to whoever's next or to Kevin to, to compare. That's great. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions, put them in the chat function. Um, Although Joe has to shoot off, I'm sure somebody else from our author list will, or our contributors will try and answer that question uh, on his behalf. Um, so thanks very much, Joe. Appreciate that. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Hannah, Hannah Bargawi. So I'll hand over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and it's nice to see so many familiar faces, uh, including in the attendance list. So my chapter is chapter 13 in the book, and that's titled, How Has Economics Addressed the Question of Gender? So the history to this, in terms of my contribution, is the fact that we have, for a few years now, had a module in the economics department, which is called Gender Economics, and that's offered primarily to our undergrads, but um, shared among our postgrads. And that sort of covers some of the questions and issues I addressed in the chapter, um, as well as more specific questions. And I think it's a particularly interesting one, because I think for a lot of people, there's an assumption that when you ask that question, how has economics addressed the question of gender, people will often say, well, it hasn't across both neoclassical economics, as well as through the history of economic thought. And I think this um, chapter allowed me to, to unpick that a little bit and to say, well, actually, there have been attempts. We can't say it hasn't. There have been attempts, both from the more mainstream perspective, as well as if we go back into the history of economic thought, it has been addressed, perhaps not adequately, but there are things that we can glean from that. And I think the main message I want to kind of come across from the chapter is the fact that actually, when we go back to the history of economic thought, it may have addressed questions of um, gender, and that goes for um, issues of race, um, ethnicity. It has addressed them perhaps poorly, but I think we can take something from the methods and the, from the approach in the history of economic thought that are useful for understanding those questions today. So I think that usual assumption that they haven't been addressed um, is one that we have to unpick with that with this chapter. So what I attempted to do was really start um, not by going back, but starting with where we are now and what has mainstream economics had to say on gender. And for that, I think ostensibly a lot of neoclassical econo economists would argue that they have addressed gender. And in particular, the new home economics, Gary Becker, Ted Schultz, uh, their attempt to consider issues of gender, whether that's through topics such as um, marriage, divorce, the household itself, they would argue is their way of addressing questions of gender. And so what I wanted to do was show that that's clearly a very poor understanding of issues of gender. 
And in order to do that, the thing that this chapter does is focus on one particular area, and that is the area of work. And that's where predominantly a lot of questions around gender keep on arising, whether that's the gender pay gap, um, occupational segregation, paid versus unpaid work. So it's a sort of a useful area to consider this question of, of um, gender in economics. So whilst neoclassical economists argue that they've ostensibly dealt with, uh, with gender, I show in this chapter that that's a very poor understanding. And in particular, what it does is take traditional methods and approaches from neoclassical economics and deploy them to looking within the household in particular. And that leads us to actually a very poor understanding. So I think perhaps the most useful area that this is really highlighted is by looking at something like the gender pay gap and the causes of that, where the argument for neoclassical economists will be, well, we can understand the causes of that by um, the acquiring of human capital by individuals. The more human capital you acquire, the more education you have, this should allow you to have a higher income and ultimately to resolve the pay gap. Now, clearly, we know that's not the case. That hasn't occurred. So neoclassical economics actually is very poor at um, answering these questions. So I think for that, what's then interesting is to revisit ideas. And I think there's two big areas that I look at in the chapter that allow us to look at this differently. And they are the old institutional economists and then the um, political economists, particularly Marx, that allow us to bring in a kind of social reproduction approach um, to issues of gender. So I think a nice example of that, again, going back to the issue of um, work, uh, is to think about what causes um, pay gaps. Is it down to different human capital acquisition or actually are there other causes? So that institutionalists have brought issues of discrimination, for example, to the forefront. So a lot of feminist economists are, rather than relying on the tools and the methods that our neoclassical economists have put forward, have gone back to history of economic thought to try and use alternative methods. Um, so whether that's Barbara Bergman, for example, to revisit some of the ideas of the institutional economists, or I think the big area that's really revisited now is um, questions of paid and unpaid work and whether we actually see the value in work. There was some really nice, interesting work that's been done recently around why we are seeing, for example, um, the profession of coding computer coding and software programming, having been traditionally, when you go back 50 years ago, a female dominated profession, having now become one that is male dominated. Um, and there was a really nice quote that I sort of wanted to highlight this with, which says, when men enter female heavy field, perceptions of women don't improve, perceptions of the job do. And I think that really goes to show um, what has tended to happen and what we can glean from looking at issues not using the neoclassical methods, but instead going back um, to the history of economic thought. So I think in that sense, um, yeah, the main message I really wanted to come across is the fact that whilst political economists themselves may have not had a huge amount to say, the fact that they see phenomena as socially embedded, the fact that um, they allow us to look at structures um, rather than at individuals, is something that a lot of feminist economists have picked up. So actually, it's a really useful way of um, thinking about a particular issue. And I think as well as gender, this also allows us to think about er other areas of inequality, whether that's um, race or ethnic or disability. Um, the fact that there's something from um, history of economic thought around methods and tools and looking at a problem in a different way, I think that's really valuable. I'm not going to take any more time because I know there's lots of other people that have got things to say, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Hannah, for that. Um, really interesting chapter and, and important issue. Uh, so our next speaker is Satoshi. And Satoshi will <laughs> give us an overview of his chapter on uh, rationality. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Elisa and Kevin, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so the chapter I contributed to this book uh, is titled, Are We All Rational Optimizing Agents? Um, and this chapter actually comes uh, pretty much at the beginning of the book. This is uh, just after the introduction. 
and perhaps together with uh, Rania's chapter, which uh, I, th I think she follows me uh, in this webcast as well, uh, is slightly different from the other chapters that you heard so far and you will hear afterwards in that um, it's rather than focusing on a particular topic, uh, this chapter focuses on um, some of the fundamental methodological uh, approaches in neoclassical economics and tries to locate them in contrast with uh, different schools of economic thought. Uh, so in particular, this chapter is concerned with the assumption of methodological individualism and the choice theoretic framework based on uh, instrumental rationality, uh, which are two of the uh, key guiding principles of neoclassical economics. The chapter opens by outlining these assumptions in uh, neoclassical economics and how this leads to a particular conceptualization of the actions and behavior of uh, individual economic agents. Um, and I then bring in some of the critiques uh, to the narrowly defined neoclassical economics approach uh, from within the mainstream as well, uh, including those by uh, behavioral economists. Um, and and behavior, behavioral economics have focused on different cognitive processes that challenges the assumptions uh, of rational agents in neoclassical economics. Uh, and then the chapter brings in uh, some of the classical political economists, uh, such as Adam Smith, who is often uh, attributed with the idea of the invisible hand and the notion that uh, self-interested private individuals uh, optimizing decisions lead to a socially optimal outcome in spite of their intentions. Uh, but when we bring in Smith's other writing that focuses on uh, moral philosophy, um, a more nuanced picture emerges uh, that deals extensively with various motivations beyond self-interest that shapes uh, human behavior. Uh, I also bring in uh, Karl Marx's approaches to class relations, uh, which is located in his uh, materialist conception of history. Um, and again, while Marx is often uh, understood or misinterpreted as representing a deterministic reading of history in which human agency is undermined, the chapter shows that how Marx's analysis indeed emphasizes individual agencies actively shaping material conditions as much as they are shaped by them. Uh, nevertheless, for Marx, uh, for uh, how production or consumptions are organized and hence how uh, people behave must be explained by examining the structure and historical specificity of the social system, rather than merely understanding these outcomes as a result of individual choices and uh, optimizing uh, exercises. Uh, the chapter also covers the institutionalist approach by Thomas Veblen. Uh, and his conception of human actions, which is shaped by uh, habits, traditions, conventions, cultures, uh, and not crucially by preferences or rational choice as assumed in neoclassical economics. Uh, and finally, the chapter brings in John Maynard Keynes uh, and his argument that uh, economic agents interact with one another in such a way that generates its own dynamics that cannot be reduced to uh, models of atomized agents. Uh, I also contrast Keynes' rendering of probability theory as inadequate as a guide to model uh, economic decision making under an uncertainty in contrast to the uh, neoclassical approach to risk. And uh, overall, the purpose of introducing these different uh, authors and approaches is not just to learn them just for the sake of it, as, as Kevin uh, introduced at the beginning, uh, very much the motivation of the book uh, is to kind of speak to particular issues and concerns uh, in the contemporary world. Uh, it's, it's really to kind of highlight how these differences reflect different kinds of assumptions they make about the behavior of individuals, but also crucially about uh, how the relation between agents and broader economic systems and social structure can be theorized. Um, so uh, I think the, in conclusion, uh, the chapter outlines how um, these differences might lead to different ways to understand what goes on in our world uh, and how we, we can act or uh, act against it. 
Uh, and I think having a broader perspective of understanding the opportunities, constraints and capacities as individuals in shaping the economy and society is extremely important at this moment in thinking about the post-COVID uh, world. Uh, so thank you very much and I'll, I'll hand over to the next person. Um, yeah, an important chapter that's right at the beginning of the book and is followed by a chapter on the role of mathematics in economics and I'll hand over to Arania for that. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this. You can hear me, right? Yeah, very good. Um, yes, so my chapter follows from Satoshi's and it is similar in the sense that it doesn't focus on one particular theme, but it rather um, deals with this kind of like broader methodological issue about uh, the mode of analysis and um, the, uh, the formalization of, um, uh, of the scientific inquiry, if you will. Um, the, the premise of, of this chapter is to essentially um, challenge the uh, claim that lies at the heart of uh, mainstream economics in both uh, teaching and research uh, in the sense that um, the discipline is, is a technical uh, discipline uh, whereby mathematics offers the correct formalism uh, for economic investigation as it is uh, the only means for it to be understood as scientifically rigorous. Um, so this is a chapter that is using um, history of economic thought in two distinct ways, let's say. Uh, the first way is by um, uh, following the evolution of the mathematization of economics within the actual history of economics. Um, uh, and it does so uh, by essentially showing how historically, when and how the mathematization uh, formalism uh, takes over the discipline. Uh, and in so doing, it also breaks away from the um, unsubstantiated historical account that we usually see uh, that actually understands this mathematization as part of a cumulative natural process. Uh, um, that is synonymous to progress. This is essentially the progress of the discipline that is, of course, as an account, both a historical and historically inaccurate. Um, so it starts historical uh, evolution part starts from the uh, classical uh, political economy epoch uh, to then leads us through the marginalist revolution to then um, the post-war Americanization, if you will, of the discipline together with the uh, formalism revolution in the 50s to then kind of show how um, the mathematics took place uh, together with a series of different uh, historical movement and changes, ideological uh, as well. And the second way in which this chapter uses history of economic thought is by then looking at through this uh, historical account, first look at the implications of, of what it means to become, um, to be to become more mathematical. So what is actually being, um, uh, how essentially the substance or the content or the history or the social are being displaced uh, by the form of, of neoclassical and later on what we're gonna call mainstream. Uh, but the second of incorporating history of economic thought is by essentially using particular um, examples, particular authors, um, from classical political economist uh, until Keynes to then have a look at how one can uh, move away from the mathematical formally together with the methodological individualism that Satoshi was talking about of the neoclassical to then show different modes of analysis um, uh, that uh, essentially are much more inductive as opposed to deductive and um, what elements these different distinct modes of analysis like Smith, Ricardo, Marx, uh, Keynes bring on the table as opposed to um, the mathematical formalism. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, um, yes, so these are the two main elements of this chapter. Thank you. Um, so our next two chapters 
address again two key issues and aspects of neoclassical economics we have um, the pr production and consumption so we're going to first start with Mary who's going to talk to us about the chapter on consumption followed by Susan who's going to talk to us about the chapter on production over to you Mary okay hi everyone oh can you hear me my computer seems to have frozen yeah it's good okay <laughs> um, so consumption consumption is an interesting one because in the chapter I argue it's both ubiquitous in and completely absent from mainstream economics uh, ubiquitous both because consumption is the ultimately the end goal of all economic activity uh, I think it's very hard to think of an economic activity that isn't that isn't ultimately underpinned in some way uh, by meeting needs wants and desires of people uh, and it's ubiquitous because uh, neoclassical consumer theory is uh, in many ways the foundation stone of all mainstream economic theory um, and yet it's absent I argue uh, because consumer theory isn't really about consumption it's a theory of choice according to which uh, choice is made on the basis of preferences which are underpinned by a set of assumptions. Uh, these assumptions that produce a technical apparatus which can then be applied to all sorts of choices, many of which go beyond or have nothing to do with consumption. Uh, so I start by looking at the roots of the, this theory of choice, neoclassical consumer theory, in utilitarianism and the two core assumptions that make up that theory. First is that individuals are utility maximizers. They will always behave in a way to maximize their own utility. Uh, I think it's interesting here to note the elision or slippage from what is in utilitarianism uh, a value claim. The morally good society or the morally good state of affairs is one in which total utility is maximized to what is effectively a descriptive claim or an ontological claim about individuals i.e., individuals will always make decisions on the basis of what will maximize their utility uh, and then the second assumption uh, is that individuals are instrumentally rational in pursuing their own activity uh, there's some overlap here with Satoshi's section, I think, which sort of illustrates the ubiquity of neoclassical consumer theory. Um, so instrumentally rational, they'll always use the best available means to achieve their ends, uh, with the implication being that they're both uh, perfectly rational and have perfect information. Uh, so together, those two assumption give us, assumptions give us the model of utility optimization subject to a bu budget constraint, which every economic student from first year will be familiar with. Uh, so, so start by setting that out as the kind of the core of mainstream economics is what mainstream economics has to say on consumption. And then look for alternatives. Um, and I divide the alternatives into two categories, one of which uh, it sort of accepts the, the broad framework of neoclassical consumer theory, accepts the reduction of consumption to choice, uh, but challenges particular assumptions. Um, so to run through some of the ones that I cover, uh, questioning whether people are actually utility seekers or whether human desires are more complex, uh, challenges to perfect rationality. So an example of this is Akerlof, Spence and Stiglitz's information theoretical theoretic economics. Um, another is uh, Kahneman and Tursky's work on uncertainty. Uh, notable that both of those sets of authors won Nobel Prizes for their work challenging or adapting the theory of the assumption of perfect rationality. Uh, another example is those who argue that preference formation is independent, interdependent rather than fixed and exogenous. Um, and then there's a few more that I consider, but I think the, the sort of the takeaway from that section uh, is really about the flexibility of the core theory and its ability to incorporate and adapt to these challenges. Uh, so it has a ready-made answer, for example, to the claim that people aren't really utility seekers or aren't really selfish optimizers. They may have other regarded desires. So the theory can simply be redrawn to, to include other regarded desires as a form of utility maximization and it fits into the same theory um, 
I, I argue that informa information theoretic economics, well, it's adapted the framework, it hasn't fundamentally challenged it. Um, so the core theoretical framework, that technical apparatus is highly, highly adaptable, uh, highly resilient to those kinds of challenges. This isn't the case for a second set of alternatives, which, uh, well, I, I say break completely from that choice framework, but it's not so much break completely from that choice framework so much as are drawn from other disciplines, um, mostly, not entirely. Uh, so one example is behavioural economics, uh, which starts from cognitive psychology uh, and psychological experiments to show how things like rules of thumb, loss aversion, and so on, are all features of how people actually behave, but they don't fit into uh, the framework of a rational optimizer. Um, a second one, uh, Veblen's theory of conspicuous consumption. Uh, so according to this, the working class seek to emulate the consumption patterns of the leisure class, uh, and they do this even when it's to their detriment. So what's significant here is that Veblen sees consumption uh, as a a cultural phenomenon, fundamentally a cultural phenomenon, something that's constitutive of identity. Uh, and the way that we consume isn't necessarily always in the best in our best interest. We're not always doing what's right for us. It may be contrary to our best interests. Uh, you see the same kind of um, approach in Marx's theory of commodity fetishism. Um, so, and this is Marx, is very specifically talking about consumption in the context of a capitalist system of production and exchange. So the essentials of life are produced by and large as commodities. Uh, and the key thing for Marx here is the exchange value dominates use value, which he argues these commodities to appear as, as if they're independent of the social relations that underpin them, in particular, independent of the exploitation of the worker, the very worker in producing them that ends up consuming them. Uh, and the kind of ideas of commodity fetishism, conspicuous consumption, have developed, have, have, have found no place in mainstream economics uh, and have tended to evolve through disciplines such as marketing. So in contemporary marketing departments in university, you'll see the study of the manipulation of ideas through advertising, for example, is one of, one of the kind of central features of the discipline. Um, sheds huge, allowed, huge amounts of light on how we actually consume things, uh, how we make decisions about what we consume, how that affects us, how that affects the wider economy, how this is factored into how things are produced. Um, very, very informative about how the real world economy functions, uh, but doesn't fit at all within that neoclassical choice theory uh, framework. Uh, and then the last alternative uh, is second in the second set of alternatives that I look at is the systems of provision approach, which I argue is an attempt to to bridge the gap by between uh, sort of a theory of consumption that focuses on the material features of commodities or goods that we consume and more cultural approaches that focuses on the meanings that we attach to goods um, by looking at the entire material chain of provision how goods are produced from start to finish, uh, including how that production shapes the meanings that end up being attached to goods, which in turn shape our consumption. Uh, so those are the main sections of the chapter. I think one of the main takeaways, or the, probably the most important takeaway, is uh, what it says about economics and interdisciplinarity. So on the one hand, you've got this neoclassical consumer theory, uh, which has ended up uh, being the driving force of what's called economics imperialism. So this very flexible, very adaptable choice framework, which we've seen uh, through things like free economics be applied well beyond the realm of consumption to explain all kinds of human behaviour, uh, all kinds of academic disciplines, criminology, anthropology, um, really detached from consumption. But it's, it's, I think the term economics is per imperialism is really important here because it's, it's, it's very one-sided uh, interdisciplinarity. It's not disciplines learning from each other. It's economics imposing its own worldview, its own theoretical framework on other disciplines. Uh, so that's one 
sort of vantage point and interdisciplinarity. The other is that in looking for alternative approaches to consumption and looking for uh, other ways to shed light on actually existing consumption to better understand how we make decisions about what we consume, how that affects us, how that shapes how things are produced and so on. We were forced to look outside of economics and into other disciplines, sociology, marketing, and so on. Um, so I think that really highlights the kind of the contrast between the potential for economics and learning from other disciplines, um, where it's had a very, very narrow worldview, uh, and the dangers of economics imposing its own view on other disciplines. And thanks, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, Mary. It's a really nice, nice way of uh, ending, thinking about this contrast between learning and imposing. So thanks for that. Um, so our next speaker is Susan. Susan's going to talk about the other key element of neoclassical economics. Well, not the other, but one of the key element, which is uh, production. So over to you, Susan. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, great. Thank you very much for organising this and for organising uh, the project itself. It's really great to be reunited with uh, many of you um, um, here. Um, so yeah, this chapter is titled, How Are Things Produced? Um, one of the exercises I sometimes uh, conduct with new students to economics is to try and ascertain what the base of their knowledge and understanding of the field is. So one of the first things I would do is to, may, might be to ask them either to define economics or to come up with what they think are three economic variables. And you can imagine GDP pops up almost every time. Um, so GDP, gross domestic production, it's the most widely used measure of an economy. Uh, it measures the size of the economy according to, the, to, to its approach as a sum of all the goods and services produced within that economy. So given the centrality of production, uh, Hi, Susan. I think we've lost uh, Susan there. We've lost your audio, Susan. Yeah. And now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. great. I apologise. I don't know where I got up to. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just basically trying to make a point that uh, even the question of how things are produced does not enter the the uh, the, uh, the the minds of neoclassical economists. Are you now still having trouble hearing me? Hello, what about now? If this stops again, we hear you. Hello. if this stops again, shall we move to somebody else and I'll come back? Okay. Yeah. We can right, do great. well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah. So so that's a big question. You know, given how important. Thank you, Shorty, for that. How important production is. Uh, why it's it's not even sort of dealt with, and it's not accidental actually. If you open the standard neoclassical textbook and you look at uh, producer theory and in uh, theories of industry, just as Mary had said now produce theory has nothing to do with production itself in fact it's really consumer choice theory inverted and that's not accidental that's been produced to make the uh, theory of market exchange uh, and the technical apparatus deployed work right so in this way production is itself just depicted as a mathematical function with some inputs um, x1 and x2 as I'm really sorry, my daughter's just come into the room. Nina, I'm speaking in a meeting at the moment now. I'll come back very soon. Uh, <laughs> hey, do you want to have a look at everyone? Why don't you have a look at everybody while I've just finished talking and then we'll come back. Yeah, do you want to do? I'm so sorry.
sorry, failed deployment of other parents. I, I, this is typical that, you know, that nothing happens. And then when I'm presenting, right. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, how can a phenomenon so central to exist? Susan, we've lost your voice again. Susan, your voice has gone again. I think you mute yourself by accident. Mute, hello? How about that? Now we can hear you. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. I'm sorry, there is a sign here that's saying we can notice we might have audio issues, but um, uh, yep, yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe we have to decide when to give up on me. <laughs> So this this chapter uh Kevin, I think we have lost Susan. Yes, I think we've lost Susan. I think let's um okay. let's move on then, I Sorry, think. Sorry, I'm back. Okay. Give up on me. <laughs> no, please uh, finish your point, Susan. We can hear you. We okay. can't see you. That's fine. Okay. If if it cuts out again, I'll just stop. Okay. We'll okay. That. Yes. Okay, thank you. So the, the way in which I've tried to organize this chapter is to both sort of look at different theories from history of economic thought, from neoclassical producer theory, um, to competent, no, uh, contractual theories and competence-based theories. And I look also at Marx, uh, Adam Smith and Marx, and then more recently at various value chain approaches. And the way in which I've tried to organize this is first, it's not only to try and sort of critique each of these according to their internal logic. So I try and uh, explicitly note what the main units of analysis are, the analytical focus, the analytical approach, and what the central orienting concepts are. But also, I've tried to uh, discuss a bit how particular ideas gain purchase as the production, as production itself becomes restructured at different levels of the global economy. So, so this is really just to try and relate both historical change with the way in which we theorise and way in which ideas become uh, become popular. Um, so, if we look at the 1930s, there was a very clear attempt to critique by way of critiquing neoclassical economics to open the so-called black box. There was a recognition that uh, neoclassical theory, the firm, whilst the firm was a unit of analysis, actually said nothing about production. It was one of these, you know, what they call a sausage machine. The inputs go in, you turn a crank and something comes out. And there's nothing in there about the way in which uh, production itself is organized, what the origins of technological change might be, where productivity gains uh, come from. Um, so a number of uh, authors did come, you know, Susan, I think we've lost you again. So perhaps, Kevin, we should move on to Nina. Sorry, Susan. Yes, let's do that. Sorry, Susan, you're just getting going again as well. Sorry about that. Um, OK, so we'll hand over to Nina, whose chapter is on the role of money in the economy. Nina, over Thank to you. you. Thank you. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, cool. So thank you very, very much. This is I've just come out of my maternity leave. So this is my first webinar. I'm, I'm, I'm re-emerging to this new world of virtual things. I hope everything goes right. Um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to speak without audience, which is odd. So this is um, a, a joint paper with my colleague Peter Hughes uh, at Leeds. And our task was to um, talk about money and the role of money in different schools of thought. And what we have done in this chapter is, in a way, a kind of a hybrid form, a combination of things. We have, on the one hand, uh, looked at the key uh, schools of economic thought and their approach uh, to money. And within these three kind of key schools of economic thought, which we chose to analyze, we've also tried to adopt a slight um, okay, we have tried to adopt um, a history of economic thought approach, although at the emphasis was probably more on analyzing the different forms of money. 
But what we try to do uh, in these individual or when analyzing these different school of economic thought, uh, we try to ask three main questions. The first question which we thought, or we, and we try to analyze it, uh, you know, parallelly to each, to each school to tease out what are the main tenets of money to then come to the implications. So our first question was, well, why do we need money in these approaches? What are its functions? Um, it's quite a complex thing. It often very goes wrong. Uh, it's, also, it's always different. So why do we need money in the first place? Or why do different economic approaches think, why do we need money? The second the question we ask is, well, what is actually money? What is its form? Can we look at it? What, you know, what is its actually physical object of it? And then the final question we asked was, well, how does it emerge? Where does actually money come from? And of course, these different questions were linked and are not always that easy analytical separably, but it kind of gave us an idea or a way of structuring the different economic approaches. And what we, the, um, and then what are coming then from these different ways or these three questions, we then try to tease out the implications, the answers to these questions had in these approaches. And particularly, we're interested in the implications this had for the way we look at banks and the financial systems, the ro role of the state, so how does the state govern or not govern money, and finally, what is the nature and effectiveness of monetary policy in these three different approaches. And the approaches we looked at, sorry, I probably should have said that from the beginning, is on the one at neoclassical economics. Then we have looked at schools of thought which build on Keynes and Schumpeter and are now very broadly classified as post-Keynes in economics. And then we looked at Marxist economic thought and the nature of money um, in Marx. So I just want to say very, very briefly in my remaining three minutes, just maybe very, very shortly, how these three questions, so what are the functions of money, what are the forms of money, and how does it emerge? How have the, these questions been answered in these different schools of economic thought? And what are the implications then um, for banks, the state, and monetary policy? Right, in neoclassical economics, which really kind of bases itself on classical economics, so Hume, Ricardo, Smith, and most prominently developed by Jevon and Semenga in the 19th century, the basic function of money is basically to facilitate exchange. So what money does is it makes sure that we don't, and also that's how it emerges, is that we don't have to kind of engage in inefficient barter, where we have the so-called co coincidence or the lack of the coincidence of wants. So the fact that I want to barter exactly the same as you want to barter. And in order to remove that potential inefficient or not lack of coincidence of wants and to make market exchange more efficient, we need money. Because money then allows us to kind of trade these things without actually having to wanting the same. And so this is the kind of the, the function of money. The function is to facilitate exchange. The emergence of money is out of this private um, meeting of individuals trying to kind of uh, exchange objects. And the final thing is then what the form of money, the nature of money is basically in neoclassical economics is commodity money. So what then actually becomes money um, emerges out of this private exchange and it, money will be one commodity which has certain properties, which we discuss in the chapters, in the chapter, which then emerges to be the um, money in, in the system. But it is fundamentally a commodity. Now, what does that mean for our big question? Well, the first thing is that given that this comes, money emerges out of the private exchange, this means there's no role for the state whatsoever in money. Money, uh, the state doesn't govern money, it's a private, it's a private um, object. The final, the second thing is that given that it's a commodity, also banks have nothing to do with it. Um, so banks by themselves uh, are not important for the supply um, or the, the role of money. And finally, that also means that the, the amount of money is exogenously determined by the central bank um, and any change in the money supply will need to an equivalent increase in the price level. So this is the quantity theory of money. So just to summarize, so there is um, the money is there to facilitate exchange. It emerges out of this facilitation of exchange and it's primarily commodity money. Now, in post Keynes in economics, this is very, very different. So in post Keynes in economics, my clock tells me we've got five minutes. In post Keynes economics, money emerges, from the, emerges out of the passing of time. So there's real time which creates uncertainty, which creates the need for money. 
And for the two main fathers of this approach, if you want to, for Schumpeter, money is necessary or emerges out of the need to finance production. Because we have got two episodes, we need money to get the production process going. For Keynes, money is really there to deal with the fundamental uncertainty which emerges from the passing of time. So we need a store of value which allows us to transition from one period to the other. Um, and money, so money then becomes, uh, so money fundamentally, so money is there in the passing of time and money is there to allow us to meet, um, is, 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 is there to kind of act as a means of settlement and allows us to transfer a means of payment in the course of time. So the form of money is basically or, or, or fundamentally credit money. So money is not so much a commodity, but is a debt to credit, credit relationship between agents in the economy and it emerges at least in the in a kind of mature capitalist system out of the private activities of banks so what does that mean for our three questions well the first means that in post keynesian economics there's a fundamental role of banks and in uh, credit activities and in the in the supply of money or in influ influencing uh, the monetary dynamics the second thing is that there's also a fundamental role for the state to govern uh, the supply of money, but also to kind of govern the financial system as the key agent um, of the um, in supplying money. And then finally, we have Marxist political economy, which is as you know, which is in a way, in, in very broad terms, a slight of a hybrid between uh, the neoclassical view of money and the post Keynesian view of money, because it's both in a way a commodity view of money of a credit view of money. But Marx ontologically takes a slightly different approach and really starts with the emergence of money. And he says money emerges as the universal equivalent, um, which um, brings together use value and exchange value together. And for Marx and for Marxist political scholars, in the historical materialist approach, the form of money is not so much whether it's credit money or commodity money on the one hand and the other hand, but it really the form of money depends on the specific historical materialist conditions and the economic structure, which means that in today's capitalist economies or financial capitalist economy, um, the form of money we see is mostly credit money. And that also in Marxist political economy gives a fundamental role to banks, the financial activity, and of course in this approach also the instability which um, banks and money create. So this is in a very nutshell our overview um, of the different approach of money embedded in a history of economic thought approach reflecting on the contributions. Thank you and I'll stop there. That's great. Thanks very much Nina. Um, so just to remind everybody if you want to ask uh, some questions then do add them into the chat function. Elise and I will be monitoring that and uh, as we have our last speaker now um, Shakib who will talk about the chat on growth. So I'll hand over to Shaki, but um, yeah, do think about some questions and um, add them in the chat function. Okay, over to you, Shaki. Are you okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. So the chapter I, that we published, I published it with Elisa, co authored, and we're on uh, it's a chapter on theory, growth theories in economics. Now we aim to go beyond the, the news you account of uh, growth theories that you see presented, which focuses on the neoclassical growth theories. And we present uh, account of the classics, what the classics said about growth. And then we go on to Keynesian accounts of growth and Schumpeter and evolutionaries. Throughout the chapter, we focus a bit on the role of the steady state balanced growth path in the growth theory and on the understanding of the conception of time that underpins the analysis. So just to summarize the structure of the chapter, we first start off by uh, providing an overview of conceptions of time in economics so difference between historical time and logical time that underpin the um, distinct the dichotomy or the breaking of macroeconomics and growth theory and the reason why we explore this is because we feel it's something that's already explored when we discuss in economics it's kind of at the base of it so once we explore these concepts we then go on to a historical account of the development of neoclassical uh, economic growth theory. So we go through on the Haradoma model and then talk about how the knife edge problem within that led to the solar model which tried to collect and then how 
the exogenous technological change led to emergence of endogenous growth theory. Throughout this, we focus on the role of the SSBG and present, allude to some of the critiques of, of these methodologies, such as the Cambridge Capital critique and the return of the knife edge issue in a new growth theory. After we do this, we've we provide an overview of the classics, focusing on the works of Smith, Ricardo, and Marx. And then we go on to post Keynesian economic growth themes. And we contrast how the knife edge problem was solved in the, the, the knife edge problem of the Haridoma model was solved in post Keynesian economics compared to um, neoclassical economics through the use of the savings ratio in the Caldor Passanati model. And we emphasize the role of aggregate demand in post Keynesian um, economic growth theory. Um, throughout that section, we focus a bit on the works of Kalecki, so for the reasons why aggregate demand is important in economic growth, and also the debates for the wage versus profit led growth. We attempt to relate some of the, relate how the short run and long run are connected in some of the post Keynesian works while exploring um, how the actual rate of growth can change technological change in the works of Caldor. Then after we've done this, we then produce, go into uh, looking into the works of Schumpeter and we emphasize how Schumpeter focused upon innovations as the rock for um, understanding economic growth and aspects such as creative destructions, which aspect of creative destruction and the role of monopoly profits in his analysis, and also the roles of financial markets in development. Upon that, after presenting Schumpeter, we then go on to the evolutionary theory of um, development, which builds upon this work of Schumpeter, showing the connections. And we talk about how these focus on understanding um, the innovation process and how the understanding of knowledge for innovation arises and emphasize the path and education of all this literature and how it's embedded in historical time. And that's it. I know it's a bit short, but I thought we'd be short on time, so I just really want to make a quick summary. We can't hear you, Kevin. Kevin, can you? We can't. We can't hear you, so I'm not sure you're speaking. Ah. We can see you now, so maybe. If Yes, we can hear you again. Can you hear me now? Sorry, was I rambling on without you being able to hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I was just going, I was just picking up on the, um, well, encouraging some questions, but um, just commenting on uh, the comment by Farwa in the uh, chat function. And so, yeah, absolutely acknowledging, yeah, that definitely the next step for this would be to engage with um, forces from the global south and incorporate those into um, this teaching approach. So thanks for that contribution. Uh, do we have any other questions or contributions? There is another question by Leslie on which textbook to use if, if for someone starting to teach basic principle of economics. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that. Perhaps anyone else from the from our presenters want to say something to that, but my suggestion would be to have a look at this particular book because I think it quite nicely, perhaps not for basic principles, but it's quite apt to accompany any teaching in economics at from second year undergraduate level onwards as it, as it, com as it critically dissects those core topics of rationality, or so the methodological issues of individual uh, rationality, mathematics, and then the topical issues of consumption, production, money, uh, growth, uh, distribution, etc. So I think um, it's it's a it's a very good resource for any economics teacher to fall back on, even when they start teaching uh, economics uh, at basic principles, as it will allow teachers perhaps to make sense of how neoclassical economics uh, navigates 
particular uh, issues and how it fails to actually allow us to understand uh, properly uh, why economic phenomena present themselves in the way they do. Um, so, so this is, yes, another shout out to uh, invite you to um, have a look at the book and, and, and see, um, you know, how it can contribute to a better teaching in economics as well as a better student uh, experience. Um, I see a long question from Achilles for Satoshi and Urania. So Satoshi and Urania, can you engage with uh, Achilles' question, please? Perhaps if Satoshi wants to go first, Sorry, I'm, I'm still hearing questions. So. <laughs> Rania, you can go first. Yeah, I'm still in the middle of reading it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll read it for everyone. Um, there seems to be a recurring pattern where neoclassical economists always manage to respond at least partially to critiques. No social classes, they add recovering non recovering households. No money, they add indigenous money. No, no bubbles, they add transports and national bubbles. No distribution effects, they add income distribution effects on effective demand. Rational expectations, then we have near rational and learning. And to link this with Ryan's fact on that, no endogenous crisis, they recently started adding limit cycles in new Keynesian DSG models. So what do you think is the best way to move forward? Should we beat them in their own game by building better models? Or should we try to fill the gaps, focusing on less formal approaches at the fringes of academia? How can we take over the profession? So uh, this is a great question. Thank you, Achilles. And I will let Urania and Satoshi go first, but I think any of the contributors to the book uh, is, is welcome to um, respond to this particular uh, question. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Elias, for this wonderfully hard question. Um, no, I, th I think that's, that's really the, 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 the central question for all of us um, who, who are trying to kind of challenge the, uh, the, the, uh, the mainstream. Um, I guess in, in broad terms, the, the way to go about is not to uh, challenge in their game and, and beating them, but actually to promote economics as a social science and economic, you know, tr try and promote the learning and research of economics as, as a pluralist subject. Um, but obviously, the, the, that's, that may be the principle of how we want to move the debate forward, how we do this through the, uh, the, the, the embedded institutional mechanism uh, within, the, uh, within the academia in economics and, 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 and so on, I, I think is a, is, is a more kind of question of strategy and tactics. So I'm, I'm sure there are spaces in which we can challenge the internal inconsistency within neoclassical economics on its own turf, while also try to uh, curve out spaces where possible in uh, promoting economics as a broader social sub science uh, subject. Um, thank you, Satoshi. And before I hand over to Ryan, I, I just want to say also that I think that within reteaching economics and within the contributors to the book, there will be multiple opinions uh, in terms of how to answer that question, um, because I think some of us would be strong advocates of uh, modeling for the better, while others amongst us would be um, not would not see that as the best way forward in an attempt to restore economics as a social science. But I will hand over to Orania. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Satoshi and, and Elisa just said, and indeed, this is a very a uh, beautifully difficult question. Um, uh, but before going on how to move forward, I mean, I think as part of how to move forward, it is important to, to, to distinguish how things are being uh, brought back in, yes. So indeed, mainstream economics does show that it is very, um, it has this, it, this ability to adapt and expand and, and, and open up. 
to new ideas or criticism, but how this is actually uh, being brought into uh, their own framework and setting is uh, in very many occasions very distinct on how it is done, for instance, in heterodox approaches, like, for example, okay, endogenous uh, money in DSG okay, is very different than endogenous money in post-Keynesian. Uh, la, la, la. So, this is the one element. The other one is, I think we can go forward both ways, as you're saying, yes. Uh, we can move away from these very rigid math divide, because also what, I mean, I also tried to show in the chapter is that maths is, is, is a technique, right? It can be used by different approaches, that can be used by different uh, epistemologies and, 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 and methodologies. Uh, but it does have a set of limitations, right? <clears throat> then different types of maths have different types of limitations, which then brings in the pluralistic aspect that um, Satoshi was also talking about. I think we can tackle it from all sides, right? Uh, using um, different modes of, of, uh, of analysis and inquiry, uh, uh, including of more mathematically formal and more uh, non-so, right? more political economy. Uh, approaches. Yes, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thanks, Shurani and Satoshi. I, I'm wondering whether any of the other uh, presenters do want to contribute to this discussion on whether we should model more or less. What do we lose? What do we gain when we translate our theoretical propositions in a model? What's the difference between a model and a theory? Um, I think these are questions that animate us um, and, and on which we have uh, quite different, as I say, said earlier, we have quite differing views on that. So I'm not sure if anyone else wants to say something to that, to complement Urania's and Satoshi's contributions. No? Perhaps I can hand over again to Kevin to close the, um, there is no further questions and um, we, we've been here since four which is great I think it's been a, a great uh, moment to see so many of you participate both contributors and to have so many participants show up at this very exciting uh, book launch so I hope those that haven't contributed will all go out and look at the book and of course ask their libraries to buy the book and um, and, and use it as a resource as, as we continue to teach or as we continue to try to understand uh, what is economics as a discipline, what does it try to teach us, uh, what are its strengths and its weaknesses and how various traditions continue to be very much alive and continue to actually hark back to ideas uh, that have been with us since quite some time across uh, the history of, of economic thought. So, um, yeah, over to Kevin. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. So I hand over to Kevin to perhaps say the last words. Okay. Well, I mean, just a, a thanks again to all our contributors who've given a very short and challenging overview to their chapters. Uh, I know that it's not easy to do this in five or seven minutes, um, but yeah, hopefully that's given everybody else uh, a flavour for the sorts of things that we cover in our chapters and, and the different approaches taken. Um, and thanks to everybody who's um, logged in, joined us for this uh, for this webinar. Um, I think we hope to do a few more events, so uh, watch out for those. Um, and yeah, hopefully this is, you know, as, as we've kind of hinted at, this is the, this is the, the first step in um, hopefully what will be um, you know, a growing number of resources produced by colleagues, not just us, but also colleagues in our wider reteaching network. Um, if anybody wants to do a second version of this book, they're welcome. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, and we also hope that, you know, even this teaching approach, you know, people can use the chapters or apply this approach in their, in their teaching uh, to a range of different subjects in economics that, um, you know, that go beyond the, the 15 chapters. Obviously, we, we couldn't cover everything. There was some um, other potential topics that, that this approach could be applied to. I'm certainly thinking about things like trade and unemployment. Um, so there's lots of potential to to expand what, what we've done here. Um, yeah, so 
thanks to everybody. Um, and uh, should we call it a day there? Yeah. Okay, have a nice evening and take care, everybody. And uh, just to say that we should reconvene physically one day and, uh, you know, celebrate the massive achievement that is this, uh, this book. So thanks, everyone, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay, you're still there. I'm still here. Yeah, so I'm just just checking through the uh, the chat. There is just a few participants left. Everyone is dropping yeah. off. Uh, I've just put my email there. Um, great. I think we have a few more people there that are dropping off. Yeah. But uh, that was nice. Well done, Kevin. Yes, well, well done to you too. I think uh, it was a nice. It's so hard to do an overview of those chapters in five minutes. I think everyone did did really well, actually. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it was very good because we got the real gist of what the book does um, across those various uh, contributions. So great. Good. Yes. I'm gonna okay. sign off. Yes, brilliant. All right. Um, yeah. Take care. Speak to you soon. Take care. See you very soon. Bye bye. Bye.